Wonderful. All right. So to kick off our Native Plant Symposium for today, our first speaker will be Sue Trull, who's a botanist on the Ottawa National Forest. Sue is going to present on monarchs and milkweeds. Um, all hands on deck. I'll let her introduce herself a little bit more. And then following that, we'll have Jackie Manchester Kemke's talk on using native plants to support pollinators. Okay, can you see my screen, Maria? It's, it's I'm not at the moment. There we go. It's coming through. Okay, great. So yeah, my name is Sue Troll. I'm a botanist with the US Forest Service, stationed on the Ottawa National Forest. Uh, been here about 20 years. I work out of the Ironwood, Michigan office. And before that, I was with the Tongass National Forest in Alaska. Um, the main part of my job is, is rare plant protection and conservation, but I also work with invasive plants, native plant materials, pollinators, uh, research natural areas, special forest products, so a variety of things. And the, the pollinator part is, of course, the focus tonight. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about is, is the concerns for monarch butterflies. Uh oh, and this is not advancing. So there we go. Um, I want to talk to you about the monarch butterfly because it's on the brink of not extinction, but extirpation. And there are things that can be done that we can do even here in the UP where we're out of the main range. Um, but based on a paper and some work come, that came out in 2017, if we don't get an all hands on deck approach, we're likely to actually lose this phenomenon entirely. So I have a lot of material to cover, so I'll just start running through it. And as Maria said, you can have questions in the chat pod. So there's a lot of information out there for monarchs. Um, an overwhelming amount really, but some of the better websites to look at are Monarch Watch, Monarch Joint Venture, the Monarch Conservation Science Partnership, which is hosted by the U.S. Geological Survey. University of Minnesota runs the Monarch Lab. They do a lot of work with the caterpillar life cycle. Uh, Journey North, Xerxes Society, and a bunch of others. And um, you can get all these from the recording if you need that information later. And the photos come mostly from those sources as well as the Ottawa National Forest. So monarch basics here. Monarchs are our nymphalids. They're in the brushwood family. And their main range is North America. There are some non-migratory populations in Southern Florida, Mexico. Um, they're actually introduced in some parts of the world. And because of that, if the North American migratory population segment goes is lost, the around the world monarchs won't become extinct because there are these other populations. Um, the U.S. population, actually I should say the North American population, is split into eastern and western segments and we're mostly going to be talking about the eastern segment tonight. So um, you're probably all familiar with the life cycle, but for those who aren't, we'll run through this quickly. So there's an egg there. They are very small, um, but you can see them without a hand lens on milkweed leaves. They're laid singly by the female monarchs on the leaves of milkweed plants. And a female may lay over 100 eggs in her lifetime. Um, many of the monarch females that die have not laid all their eggs. So there may actually be a, a shortage of place like, rather than the, the females running out of eggs. Those eggs have a hard outer shell so they don't dry out and they hatch in between three to eight days depending on the temperature. The caterpillars then eat their way out of the egg and they start eating the milkweed that they were laid on um, and they grow until they have to molt their skin. Just like that book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, they eat and eat and then they stop for a little while and they shed their skin and keep going and those stages between molts are called instars. Monarchs go through five different instars, going from the size of about a pencil lead to about the size of a pencil. So they get bigger each, each stage. And that takes between 10 and 14 days. Again, temperature dependent. After that point, when they're in their fifth instar, the caterpillar will crawl somewhere and make a hanger and hang in a J shape. This is often not on the milkweed. They usually crawl to somewhere more protected, um, edge of a building, under a tree, um, that sort of thing. If you're raising them inside, sometimes they crawl out of the cage you have them in and they hang off a bookshelf and you don't find them till later. Um, they hang in this J shape and for several hours, 
and then they start wiggling and the chrysalis part actually splits the skin, um, pokes out of it and I have a little video of this at the end if we have time. Um, so the, the chrysalis pokes out and leaves the skin as sort of a banana peel that's left and falls off. And then they stay in this pupil stage for another couple of weeks. Um, chrysalis is this gorgeous green color for most of that time, these little gold dots on it. But just a day or two before the caterpillar or the butterfly is ready to hatch out, you can actually see the orange and black of the wings through that. Uh, the, the colors, the scales on the wings don't develop till near the end of the pupation process. So that's why you don't see them until they're ready to hatch. So then the adult emerges from the chrysalis and it, it's sort of crumpled up and it has to spend several hours um, pumping its abdomen around to distribute fluid to the wings um, and waiting for the wings to dry. Many times if they hatch out in the morning, they aren't really ready to fly off till evening or if they hatch out in the evening, not till the next morning. So they do need to be in some protected place during that time. Um, and then they'll fly around and, and they eat off of many different flowers. Now they're not restricted to milkweed like the caterpillars are. Um, they'll eat off of many flowers that have nectar for them. And when they're between three and eight days old, they'll mate and then they'll complete their life cycle just in that same general area. People often ask how you tell the boy monarchs from the girl monarchs. And you can see in this slide here, the, the green arrow on the top picture there, the male monarchs have two black what show up as spots on the, the lower wings. Females don't have those and the venation is thicker on the females. It, after you look at a few, it gets pretty easy to tell them apart. If you wanted to tell apart the caterpillars, you'd have to dissect them, so don't recommend that. Okay, let's move on to a little bit about the populations. Um, as we said, the U.S. population is split by the Rocky Mountains. And the ones west of the Rockies overwinter along the Pacific coast. And then late winter, they disperse into California, Arizona, Nevada, that general area. Um, and they complete their life cycle over on that side of the Rockies. There's very little mixing between the west and the east. The western population is much smaller than the eastern. And currently, there's only about 30,000 overwintering monarchs. Um, you can see the graph there on the right side of the slide. The Xerces Society runs a count around Thanksgiving time for the West Coast. And the blue line going up there is just the number of sites monitored. So they've been checking more and more sites, but the green bars at the bottom tell the sad tale of what's been going on with the Western population. Okay, now I'm going to move to the Eastern, East of the Rockies population, which is the one that concerns us. Um, and that there's a lot more information known about. This is the really widely studied um, migratory population that goes down Mexico. Um, so our eastern population overwinters in, in Mexico in two states. And there used to be about 19 different sites um, covering about 50 acres. That area has decreased dramatically. It's down to about only two sites. Um, that they overwinter there in these um, high elevation fir forests and they need those trees because they're at sort of the Goldilocks zone of temperature where the monarchs can make it through the winter. <clears throat> Excuse me. In late winter, early spring, after mating there in Mexico, the adults fly north to Texas in the south. The females look for milkweed plants, lay the eggs, and they'll, they'll live a little bit longer and then die off. And uh, Journey North, a group that tracks this migration, actually today posted an update. And people are seeing both the generation that came up from Mexico and the first adults of the next generation kind of overlapping. The ones that came from Mexico are looking pretty worn out. There's holes in the wings, that kind of thing. And then the other ones are fresher. So a little bit of overlap, but they've already got the first generation of adults in Texas now. So. Um, Butterflies go through that, that life cycle there in Texas and Oklahoma in that area and then they fly north and do it again and then they get up here. The third and fourth generations are up in our area. Now the survival of this first generation that's uh, going on now in Texas and Oklahoma is really important 
because that's the one that begins to rebuild the populations. So in years when there's a drought in Texas and there aren't very many flowers, then we, we don't have a good population coming on north from that and it just kind of declines from there. So then when we have this, this kind of generation cycling moving north and it's usually the fourth generation that will re reproduce up in our area and then they go into, uh, once they hatch out as adults, they go into reproductive diapause, so they don't mate and they migrate back to Mexico. They can fly about 30 miles a day, so it takes them a couple months to get all the way back down there. So this uh, figure shows you a little bit more what I was just describing. You can see the um, West Coast population just moves around in the interior of West there. A few of them are thought to go back and forth to Mexico and perhaps interact with the Eastern population, but not much. And then the Eastern population heads up um, and the bulk of the reproduction is actually in the Corn Belt area, which is outlined in the brown dashed line there. That's the the main agricultural area. Um, Highway 35 runs through the middle of that. They've been calling that the Monarch Corridor and organizing a lot of conservation efforts along that, calling it the Monarch Highway to try to get people interested. Um, you can see they kind of spread out. Uh, when they come back, there's more sort of a concentrated flyway, one along the East Coast, goes to uh, Cape May, New Jersey in that area and down. And some of those probably go into Florida where there's the non-migratory population. And then there's a sort of a second flyway coming down through Texas in that area. So like the Western uh, population, the Eastern population has been experiencing severe declines. The, the uh, way they count them in Mexico is not by individual butterfly, um, but they're counted by how many hectares are covered. And there's about 50,000 butterflies per hectare, although that varies widely, but that's sort of an average number. And they're, they count them by hectares and we're trying to get to a uh, goal of at least six hectares occupied to prevent extirpation of the monarch. So you can see that in uh, 2013 and on, the numbers weren't looking very good. And then in the winter of 2018 to 19, it looked great. There had been a lot of uh, conservation activities done in the Midwest and in Mexico and people were thinking it was working, but then just last winter things tanked again. So we're at 2.83 acres only. So why is this happening? What are, what are the main threats and what can we do about them? Um, there isn't any debate that they're in trouble, but there is some debate about the threats. The two main ones are First, loss and degradation of the breeding habitat. So the Corn Belt, our area, um, mostly the U.S. parts here. Um, and this is particularly due to loss of milkweed. There are also a, a threat from degradation in the winter habitat. Um, some logging occurred there. Most of that has been stopped now, but some illegal logging still does occur. Some winter storms, um, other things like that. Climate change is another threat, extreme weather, um, pesticides, parasites, and diseases, and then just overuse of monarchs. And we'll go into all of these a bit further. So I should point out that there is some scientific controversy over the cousins, Oberhauser, and a bunch of others who think that the main cause for this drop in population is during the breeding season due to agricultural fields being treated with herbicides. Um, but there's another school of researchers that think that fall migration and overwintering are the critical times and degradation at the overwintering sites is the main cause. So, so I want to point out that this is debate. There's no debate that both of those contribute, but which one's the more important is what, what people are arguing about. So coming back now to the agricultural threat, I want to just point out why the research seems to point toward this being the main threat. Um, crops, particularly soybean and corn, have been genetically engineered to be resistant to glyphosate, which is usually packaged as the herbicide Roundup. It's sold as Roundup ready crops. You've probably heard of that. So when the herbicide is applied to agricultural fields, the desired crop grows just fine. Everything else is killed. So we used to have farm fields with small windrows full of milkweed and other uh, 
nectar plants, things that weren't crops, um, not efficient for the farmers, so they did what they needed to. But you can see that the use of this, these crops has greatly increased. Uh, soybeans are green and corn is yellow there. And then if we look at this map, we can see that this dense use of glyphosate pretty much coincides with the main area I showed earlier that was the main breeding range for the monarch. Now there is some debate that um, such a high percent of the crops are now Roundup ready that the effect of this may not get any worse. Okay, so that's the main threat in the breeding habitat. Uh, the main threat in the winter habitat um, is different. It's not at all related to herbicide. Monarchs need dense mature canopy cover. They, if they get too cold, they freeze and they die. But if they get too warm, they break their winter torpor and they use up their stored fat reserves. So they need sort of a Goldilocks zone there that's only available in these small areas of the OML furs. And so we have changes in temperatures going on with climate change that's usually not helpful for them. I mentioned there's been some logging in the areas. There's also some bark beetle outbreaks um, that can affect those trees. Because the monarchs are in a very small area now, if there's a winter storm, it can wipe out most of the population. And that slide in the bottom right is from a big storm um, in 2002. And you, those are all dead monarchs there in front of the, the person there. He's looking at all the monarchs that fell out of the trees dead due to an, an extreme winter storm. So, and there've been four of those storms in the last few years and mortality range from 50 to 80% each time. So then you have a smaller population heading north, if that coincides with the drought in Texas, and you have another decline, and it's very hard for the population to rebound. <clears throat> so climate change can have some effects. Um, it can result in a mismatch between monarchs moving north and milkweed being available. Um, the monarchs may get there before there's milkweed to lay their eggs on. They may try to move south at the wrong time. So you can get some mismatches that way. And then as I just mentioned, the winter habitat may no longer be suitable with, if the climate keeps changing. So also some recent research that shows a period of cold temperatures is needed to trigger the monarchs to go north. So if we don't get enough cold days, they might not know to migrate. On the other hand, if we have warmer temperatures in say Ohio and Illinois for the second generation, the development doesn't work out as well. It's actually increased mortality with warmer summer temperatures. Um, these pictures at the bottom are from a, a report the Forest Service did. We were looking at how milkweed might change with climate change and the figure on the left um, the green is where milkweed is currently, and you can see there's some spots in the Upper Peninsula where we don't have so much. And then with the high emissions climate change model, um, milkweed moves north. So milkweed may move north, the monarchs may not. It, it may all not line up very well. Um, some more minor threats, uh, one of those is predation. Because the monarchs eat uh, milkweed, they build up cardenolides, <clears throat> which are toxic to some of their predators, but predation does occur. Um, the uh, blue jay pictured up there in the corner is from a cute little story on Science Friday, the case of the barfing blue jay. Um, they have to tie a, a monarch once to know that it's toxic, so some do get eaten by birds. Um, only about 10% of eggs and larvae actually complete all their stages to hatch out to adults. And there are a whole host of, of insects and invertebrates, such as ants, spiders, crab spiders, bugs, that eat the eggs and eat the larvae. Um, there was one study that found pretty much 100% of all the eggs and larvae eaten by ants in a particular patch of milkweed. There are some parasitoids that attack monarchs. And then even in the winter, there are things that eat them. Mice eat wintering monarchs, as do orioles and black-headed grosbeaks. So lots of predation. There are also diseases that threaten the existence of monarchs. Uh, the best study that is one is a protozoan, which we usually just call OE. Uh, the spores are found on the wings of monarchs and they're spread from the adults to the larvae. 
And if they have this parasite, it reduces survival size and the ability to fly. The parasite tends to build up in populations. So if it's a population that's non-migratory or if people are raising monarchs inside generation after generation, this population of the parasite builds up and pretty soon the monarchs that hatch out look, at the, look like the one in the bottom corner there. Uh, the wings don't fully unfold and they can't fly. Um, so the, the OE infection is, tends to be lower in the migratory populations than the non-migratory. So the Florida population, which just stays in the same area um, generation after generation, they have a much higher buildup of this parasite. So there's some concerns if some of the um, non-infected monarchs are going down to Florida and then perhaps coming back north, that could spread the parasite around more. Um, Another threat that it's probably not much in the Upper Peninsula yet, but I do know of at least one site, is a swallowwort non-native invasive plant. Uh, it's in the same genus as milkweed, and the monarchs can't tell the difference. They, the female monarchs assume that it's a good plant to lay the eggs on, but the caterpillars can't feed on them, so it's a sink. If eggs are laid on there, the caterpillars do not survive. So there's two species, black swallowwort and pale swallowwort. Um, they have a milky sap like other milkweeds. And you can see there in the pictures, the flowers are similar. Uh, we do have this plant at Peninsula Point on the Hiawatha National Forest, which is a area where many monarchs congregate in the fall to cross Lake Michigan. Um, so they're, they're pulling the swallowwort there, but it, it's there. So it may be other places in the upper peninsula. So you're gonna wanna keep an eye out for that. Um, captive rearing is an interesting thing. Many people have, have done this under the impression that it's a good thing, that you bring in eggs or larvae, um, raise them to adults so they aren't getting eaten by birds, they aren't being parasitized, and then you let them go. It sounds like a great idea, plus it's really fun and, and people love to see the process. But some very recent research uh, from 2019 has shown that if you raise monarchs inside, they may actually lose the ability to orient for migration. <clears throat> and they've also found that raising them inside tends to result in buildup of the parasite OE. So a lot of the experts on uh, the University of Minnesota Monarch Lab, the Xerxes Societies, no longer recommend um, rate captive rearing monarchs other than a few for educational purposes, um, classrooms often do this. And if you're going to, they recommend not more than 10 per year per educator, and definitely don't raise more than one generation. Um, start over again if you need to do it more than once. And they also suggest raising them as close to outside conditions as possible to make sure that the migration ability isn't disrupted. And you have to be very careful with sterilizing the cages uh, with bleach and then with sunlight. Um, to make sure you get rid of all the possible parasites. So a lot of uh, caveats if you're raising monarchs, um, it is really fun to do. We did it for a few years on the Ottawa, just a few. Um, hopefully we didn't cause too much damage because we didn't know, but uh, we're not doing it anymore. Okay, so I wanna move on to some of the uh, more recent developments um, and then into how you can help. So in 2014, there was a petition made to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to list the monarch under the Endangered Species Act. That's a really big step, and the Fish and Wildlife looked at that and they issued what's called a 90-day finding that said that, yep, listing might be warranted. Then they do what's called a species status assessment and come up with their listing recommendation. They were supposed to make that decision in June of 2019, but it was pushed off to December of 2020 because there's been a whole lot of activity going on that may prevent the need for listing. Uh, meanwhile, Canada upgraded monarchs to endangered under their um, law that's similar to the Endangered Species Act. And in Mexico, they're also protected. So they do have legal status in those countries as well. Um, in May of 2015, our Pollinator Health Task Force came up with a goal to increase the eastern population to 225 million butterflies, which amounts to counting six hectares worth in Mexico. So Canada and Mexico and the US all adopted this goal. Um, and then 
various scientists took that number and they modeled how we're going to get to that. So they went backwards from the number of desired butterflies to the number of necessary milkweed stems. And they came up with a, a consensus that we need 1.4 billion more stems of milkweed to support those monarchs. Um, several different models, um, different scenarios used, and they pretty much came to that consensus. So then the Midwest Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies worked on a Mid-America Monarch Conservation Strategy, and they further refined that modeling and assigned goals per state based on the percent of the state that was in the main monarch range. And you can see those numbers to the right there, uh, maybe too small to read, but some goals and, and each state um, has been looking at this. Some have actually come up with strategies. Some are still working on that. Um, so then the Monarch Conservation Science Partnership um, was looking at how they'd get, how we will get to this 1.4 billion more stems. And they looked at the sectors that can contribute. And they have five sectors, the protected area grasslands. So uh, forest service lands, state lands, anything that's an opening that's protected, those areas could be planted to milkweed. Lands that are enrolled in the conservation reserve program um, this is a natural resources, or sorry, it's a farm service agencies program where farmers can take lands out of agricultural production, put them into the conservation reserve program for an incentive, but they can be required then to plant milkweed on those lands. Uh, so that's a second sector. Uh, rights of way, lands belonging to pipeline companies, under power lines, transportation corridors, that's what that sector is. Agricultural land, and then urban suburban lands. So this group looked at scenarios where these different sectors contribute based on how much we think they actually could. And if we get modest participation from the agricultural sector, if all the others participate, then we can get pretty close to that necessary number of stems. So this is what Thog Martin and the other guys at the Conservation Science Partnership called the all hands on deck approach. Every sector has a, a role to play. And for the most part, that role is planting milkweed, but there's more to it than that. It's also need to adjust management practices and plant nectar um, species as well. So then very recently, this is really exciting, um, on April 3rd, the Canada Conservation Agreement with Assurances was signed. This is a, a special forum that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service allows um, for entities to sign to voluntarily say they'll take certain steps to protect monarchs. And if these steps are thought to be enough, then the monarch won't be listed under the Endangered Species Act. If it's not listed, that leaves a lot more flexibility for both public and private landowners. So this group was working very hard to get this document signed and they just did. Now, the other thing I want to point out on this slide is that if you look at the map at the left, you can see that the Upper Peninsula, north, northern Wisconsin, is not in the core area. The dark purple is the north core, the dark gray is the south core. Um, but we are in the, what's called the north exterior. And 80% of the total eastern monarch production comes from the north core plus the north exterior. So we're still important. Um, some potential, potential actions I want to point out. Um, these were assigned for each sector, and so mostly for the gardeners on this phone, on this uh, Zoom meeting would be the items under urban suburban planting milkweed and nectar plants, um, rewilding urban spaces, converting lawns, supporting public gardens. But two items that are under protected area grasslands also apply, and that's pollinator friendly mowing and not using neonicotinoids and other pesticides. So what can we do? We can plant milkweed. Um, and there's actually been some studies found that monarchs oviposit, that means lay eggs, uh, more frequently on milkweed in garden settings. So a small patch in your yard is great. That's helpful. Um, if you have grandchildren, small children around that might eat plants, you will, are going to want to be careful because if they ate a lot of milkweed, it is toxic. Um, so plant milkweed, plant nectar plants that bloom during the breeding and migration periods. So that's summer and fall up here. Uh, plant those nectar plants in clusters so that it's more efficient for the monarchs to forage. Try to get local native plants and make sure they're free of neonicotinoids. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. 
Um, generally, butterflies like flowers that are pink, yellow, white, red, and purple. Those are kind of the colors they key into. So those are good ones to plant. Um, and mow your lawn less frequently. This is actually research more for bees, but they found that lawns mowed every two weeks instead of every week support higher pollinator populations. Um, so I mentioned neonicotinoids. Uh, these are insecticides that are extremely toxic and persistent. They will kill the larvae, they will kill the adults, and some commercial milkweed for sale has been found to contaminate at levels that harm monarchs. So if you're buying monarch plants somewhere, you're going to want to ask um, if they've been treated with neonics or not. Okay, I'm going to talk fast here. I'm, I'm almost out of my time to leave some time for Jackie. Um, very quickly, the, the milkweeds we can plant up here are common milkweed, which goes in drier upland areas. Um, it's very clonal, it will spread. So if you're going to put it in a, a garden in your yard and you don't want it to spread, maybe a raised bed would be the way to go. 90% um, of the monarchs wintering in Mexico fed on common milkweed. So it's probably the most common for uh, monarchs. Swamp milkweed, this one likes a slightly wetter area, moist to wet soils. Um, it's actually preferred by monarchs. Um, and when I've noticed this, I, I see monarchs on this earlier in the year. I see caterpillars earlier than I see them on common milkweed. Poke, will, poke milkweed is another one we have up here that people don't know much about. Usually it actually can tolerate shade. So we find it in the woods in some open, kind of open gappy woodlands. And then the fourth one, butterfly weed is another milkweed with a watery instead of a milky sap. Um, it's currently only mapped native wise in Dickinson County, but people plant it in their gardens. This photo is from a, a garden on Lake Ogibbic where um, one of my coworkers planted it. And as soon as she did, the monarchs came and you can see a couple of caterpillars in the picture there. So as well as planting milkweed, there are some management things you can do to make it more conducive to monarch uh, propagation. Milkweeds in smaller patches tend to support more eggs laid per plant. So spread out your patches, don't make a huge one. And younger leaves tend to support more eggs. It's kind of, um, I don't know if it's more appealing to the female, but they've, it's sort of for caterpillars like eating spinach versus eating cardboard. So younger plants are more useful and some recent research out of Michigan State University found that mowing milkweed midsummer resulted in young tender shoots which are easier for the monarchs to eat, but they're also temporarily free of insect predators. And that effect lasted for two to four weeks. So you might consider mowing or trimming your milkweed patch. Um, probably not all at once, but um, see, see what effect that has. This is new research, so we don't really know exactly how it will pan out. So some plants that you might consider um, putting in for the nectar side are black-eyed Susan, wild bergamot, Goldenrods, Joe Pye weed, uh, bone set, sneezeweed, false sunflower, any of the native sunflowers, and cutleaf coneflower. Um, and I sent to Maria a PDF of a brochure that Ottawa put together on uh, native plants that you can grow in the western upper peninsula. Um, so that'll be the link. You can look at that if need be, and it has them by spring, summer, and fall. Uh, where do you get these plants? It's a little hard this year. Uh, there used to be, it's canceled because of the pandemic, but otherwise every first Saturday in June, there's a great sale over at Northern College in, in Ashen, uh, Northern Native Plants sale. Um, some of the county conservation districts sell plants. Most of those sales are canceled this year as well. Some commercial nurseries carry native plants. Um, if you're buying from a commercial nursery, be sure to ask if they're where they came from and if they're treated with neonicotinoids. Um, Brett that spoke at the uh, symposium last week runs the Hanson's Garden Village down there in Rhinelander, and that's it I've heard is a good source. Uh, Monarch Watch runs a milkweed market. So you can go on to that website listed there and I tried entering the Houghton zip code and it showed me these pictures to the right, three different plants you could get. You could get a flat of 32 for those prices shown, which includes shipping and they ship after May 15th to our area. Um, check with your local master gardener chapter. You can also collect seed and grow your own. Um, the Xerces Society runs a milkweed seed finder. I, I put that website on there, but they didn't have anything for our area. 
Same with the Midwest Invasive Plant Network Native Plant Vendor Directory. There's nothing up in our area, but if you're uh, not from the, the Upper Peninsula, you might want to check out those websites. And then down on the bottom right there, just this morning, I heard from the Superior Watershed over in Marquette that they have a special Earth Day project going and you can hop on that website and they will um, send you free milkweed seeds. First come, first served and priority to Upper Peninsula residents. I don't know how much they have. I didn't hear back and I didn't hear what species. I'm guessing common milkweed, but that just came out this morning. So if you're quick, you might get some free seed that way. Um, just to finish up real quick, I'm almost done, Maria. I know you're timing me. Uh, there are some citizen science opportunities if you're interested in, in helping with that. Journey North um, takes reports of eggs, larvae, adults, um, as well as other species like robins and whales and hummingbirds. And they even have a mobile app you can put on your phone and report your observations. Monarch Watch runs a tagging program. You can get a small tags. So you can order like 25 of them at a time and uh, net monarchs in the fall and tag them. And then they, um, if those tags are recovered later, you can actually find out where your monarch went. And then University of Minnesota runs a larvae monitoring project. You can see on the map, there's some of the sites that um, people are working this project from right now. If you go on their website, you can see um, some of the activities you can do. You can describe a site, you can um, look how much milkweed you've got and monarchs and all that kind of thing. So it's a pretty comprehensive program. And then last project, Monarch Health, is tracking the spread and abundance of the parasite OE. And they take that, you just put a sticker on the wing and, and see if you pick up some of those parasites. So um, all these websites are listed on these slides. So if you want to look later um, and contact any of those, you could. Okay, so just to finish up here real quick, the um, monarchs are in trouble and you can help plant milkweed, plant nectar flowers, participate in citizen science and uh, watch out for those invasive swallow awards. Okay, I'm just gonna run this video while uh, Maria takes any questions we have. So this is gonna be a, the uh, larvae letting the chrysalis split out. Oops, is that gonna work? Um, uh, you need to share maybe that window of your monitor. How am I gonna do that? I don't know. Um, when you go to share, um, it might like give you an option to share. Um, yeah, that should try that. Let's there see. We go. Okay, there we go. So watch closely. And it'll be like alien, <laughs> the green part coming out from <laughs> a stripey part. Yeah, so people can watch that. And then one of the questions we had was somebody asked about, you know, they said they had basically Mar marjoram in their yard, you know, it's really aggressive. And they were asking kind of about that trade off between plants that pollinators love, but then those that are like a little more aggressive or invasive. Do you have any um, kind of thoughts or ways that you think about that in your work and trying to kind of balance those things? Uh, yeah, so there certainly are some great pollinator plants that can also take over a garden and maybe not let you have the diversity you want. And if your garden allows it, one way around that is to put the aggressive ones in containers or a raised bed. People are watching that. I hate, I, I swear this is the <laughs> stuff that haunts my dreams. It's like, yeah. it's, yes, it's great. Um, and then uh, I'm trying to think again. if we had, we didn't have any other, um, we didn't have any other questions come in. I think I didn't give maybe people enough time, but I was curious. One thing I've had a couple people comment on is it seems like our local milkweed in the Western UP is kind of going nuts in the last couple of years is sort of an observation. I feel like people have commented on um, and maybe just like the weather has been good. I don't know if that's, you know, is that something that actually is happening or is more just maybe something people think they're seeing. Well, I think partly people are paying more attention because there's been a lot of publicity about the plight of monarchs, but we have several patches around my office and they have seemed larger the last couple of years. I think because we've come out of that drought that we were in for several years. Mm -hmm. you know, um, so I, I think it's partly that um, and people may have started planting it a little bit too, maybe seeing it in some right of ways where people are planting it. But yeah, I think the, the plants themselves have been more robust because we've come out of the drought. 
yeah, that's definitely a good, good point. Great. Well, we'll see people, if people have other comments, they can type those in. We can see if we have more time to answer them at the end. Um, that was really fantastic. Um, thank you so much. That was a ton of information. And we'll try and get your PowerPoint too, just because you had so many good links and we can post that if you don't mind. That'll be really helpful for people. And I did post the link um, to our page for this event, which has um, the brochures that you shared. Okay. Yep. And I forgot to mention the other brochure is a butterfly checklist which is kind of fun. You can uh, keep track of which butterflies you've seen, but it also lists the host plants for both the caterpillars and the adults. So that gives you an idea of what else you might want to plant in your gardens. Great. Okay, so do I need to stop sharing? So I that uh, Jen I, can start or you've got uh, that? Covered? I've got it. So let's okay, see here. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, All right, Jackie. You're up and just tell me if you need me to advance any slides for you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to Maria, to Jill, to Marsha Goodrich for uh, putting this together. The uh, information that I'm sharing comes from the uh, Smart Gardening from Michigan State uh, Extension and from the Prairie Nursery. Native plants, why? Why should you grow them? Well, they're already adapted. They're adapted to the growing season, to the climate, and to the soils. Um, so that, that's good. You don't have to worry about that, that part. Okay, go ahead, Maria. Um, go to the next one. So um, I've been landscaping for 40 years. Um, and I, I took the Master Gardener, ex Extension Master Gardener course in around 2015, I think. And what really got me going was two years ago when I went to the uh, Native Plant Symposium, the Prairie Nursery guy was there and uh, lots of talk about the pollinators. And I have become like a, like a vacuum cleaner salesman, like somebody that wants to get in and wants to tell you that why you should have this vacuum except that my deal is pollinators and uh, native plants seem to be the way to go so if, if if you don't know what a vacuum cleaner salesman is think about a uh, a pop-up on your site that comes up all the time really annoying because they want to sell you something well i think that uh, you need to get really excited about pollinators and, and native plants um, so um, choose a variety of plants that bloom from early spring to the late fall. And uh, I think Sue said that. I have, uh, two years ago, I planted 500 crocus as well as a bunch of um, allium that bloom at different times. I planted saskatoons, which in other word is service berry, um, or sometimes we call them sugar plum up here. Um, I have some woods columbine. I planted quite a few blueberry bushes that bloom pretty early. When I brought the blueberry bu bushes home from um, the uh, Tom's greenhouse over there in, in Lake Linden, um, they, were, they were budding, they were blooming. And when I set them out to, to get them ready to acclimate them, there were bees and other all over these. So. They need food. I was, just, I was just out there today trying to clean some of my beds out and there was this bumblebee. He looked kind of like, oh, I can barely make it to this next flower, but I'm going to. And I actually got him on a leaf and put him over to another flower because it seemed like, you know, he was just really hungry. So um, dandelions are coming. Don't don't kill them. Uh, they, they really provide early food that uh, some of our bedding plants don't, don't bloom, but, but things that we think about as weeds, like dandelions, do bloom and they do provide a lot of food. Uh, sweet woodruff uh, is going to uh, bloom pretty soon, as well as the woods columbine. Um, for as far as late fall, I have autumn joy sedum. And sometimes you'll just see bees just sitting on there in the, in the fall. I also have a lot of 
gra grass leaf goldenrod um, that was here when I bought this place. It, there's tons of it. Uh, once I found out that pollinators need it and like it, need food in the late fall to, to make, be able to overwinter, um, I decided, yep, yeah, you just get to stay. You get to stay. And then I planted New England Aster, which uh, at another landscape I had, the bees just were all over it too. So those are kind of my early spring and my late fall. I'm trying to find more. And um, it's important because they need food as soon as they emerge and they need food to get through the winter. So look for early and late. And then we have a variety in between. Um, the sizes and the shapes of blooms are really important. I, I really didn't think about it, that their tongues can be different lengths of pollinators. So um, something like a penstemon, or, and also like a foxglove, they, they have little any parts that, that are, hummingbirds also like, love those too. Um, one thing that, that I noticed is that Whoever planted this before me had hollyhocks, and they, there were a double hollyhock and a single hollyhock. And I didn't see the bees on the on the doubles. And that's they mentioned in in the stuff I read that um, hybrids, especially doubles, can not be as uh, appetizing, not be as easy to get nectar from. So think about that when you're when you're choosing. As far as the source of water, I, I'll have show a picture later. Maria will bring it up, but I have some bird baths. Um, but you have to put rocks in there so that they can gradually walk down. And then last week I learned about puddling stones from uh, Carol Moss. And uh, so I've located a couple things that I can make puddling areas for butterflies out of. And that's, that's really exciting because if you don't have a, something like that, I'm sure if you have any open water containers, you've seen things dying because they, they they're thirsty and then they, they drown. So that's important. As like Sue said um, tonight, yes, grouping your plants so you've got more than, than one. It's easier for the pollinators to get them if they don't have to move so far. And one of the most important things is to leave some soil. Um, leave some place where you don't have any compost. Uh, if it, you can put it in a out of the way place if you don't like that, but 70% of bees are ground nesting um, and they need a place to to lay their eggs. So go ahead Maria. Okay this is a list of what I have and um, I've planted since I saw this native plant symposium, I planted the Saskatoon and the cup plant. The goldenrod was here. I've planted the Menarda fistulosa and the lavender hyssop. I'll probably have lots of little baby lavender hyssop um, if anybody wants some. I've got the brown-eyed Susan and I planted New England Aster. <coughs> I planted uh, the black haw viburnum and a nine bark. Culver's root is uh, one of my favorites. It's uh, a gorgeous plant. It's very tall. There were butterflies all over it last year. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Indian feather, I don't know if it's gonna make it, but the first year I planted it, it bloomed for a long time. Forest columbine, and I also have some hybrid columbine. The panicle hydrangeas uh, bloom for a long time. Those are really nice. Um, I don't know if my coneflower made it yet. We'll see. The bee balm, I've got a purple bee balm and a red bee balm, as well as the Monarda. They, pollinators love those. I'm not sure, the Liatris is new. I hope it comes back and is happy. The Penstemon uh, is very lovely. I've got it in a couple places. The blueberries, the Ajuga. Foxglove is wonderful, sweet woodruff. 
I've got lots of lavender, lemon balm. Veronica is a plant that when you break it, its leaves, it smells like um, licorice. Uh, ladies mantle, I have a dwarf one that I got at the sale at the Trinity Episcopal last year that's quite nice. And then uh, the hollyhocks, they're amazing. They're all over Houghton and, I, and I've got some good pictures. So besides those things, I have lots of herbs because I use them for cooking and tons of bulbs. Um, then in my yard, which I have chosen not to continue to mow all of it, I've decided that just because it was planted as grass, I'm gonna let it go native and put some stuff in there. So I have dandelions and Indian paintbrush, a lot of crown vetch. This year I have uh, some nasturtiums and calendula started and I wanna get some zinnias going. I have quite a few butterfly plants uh, it's they're not they haven't germinated yet so but it told it said it would be quite a few weeks before they did so and then i ordered meadow rose from uh prairie nursery and i'm excited to add those i hope the butterfly plant makes it and uh that would be really exciting so um i think that this is a good start. I hope everything that I planted new last year uh, made it. Oh, Maria, you've got some pictures. I forgot the pictures. This is uh, just a panicle hydrangea um, with a geranium kind of bet between it, but they're really, really pretty. I, I didn't have much, many pictures of my landscape in bloom. It's, uh, it's just, they're just emerging now. So I, I had a few pictures that I took uh, and I'm just sharing a couple here at the end. Go ahead, Maria. That's the double hollyhock and it's really beautiful, but I don't see many pollinators on it. Go ahead. If you can see the bee, it's at the top um right kind of at the top it's it's a big bumblebee and that's the single hollyhock hopefully you can see that mm -hmm. okay okay go ahead maria these are this these are um hollyhocks and zinnias that i planted last year and the zinnias were a big hit uh, and I think there's some geraniums I threw in there. You can tell I like pink and purple. I'm not a big yellow fan, but I plant, like I planted the cup plant and I hope that makes it. And I know it's yellow. I can tolerate yellow, but it's not my favorite. Okay. Okay, Maria. There you go. Now, this is this year, you see that tiny, that little honey, I think that's a honeybee on the crocus, one of those 500 crocus I planted. Um, that, that's just exciting. I sat there and watched them for a long time. Okay. And there's a bee on there. It's kind of at four. It's kind of between three o'clock and four o'clock on that um, Monarda. They really like it. I've got a lot of bumblebees, so I must be doing something right. Okay, go ahead. I love this picture that I captured with the, bu the bumblebee coming at it. Um, that's the, the same plant, uh, different part of it. Okay, the crown vetch, I see Sue is saying, be careful with the crown vetch. It was here. I don't know, I'll have to ask, hopefully she can say why we need to be careful with it. It's very invasive, but it was here. So um, I'd like to know more about that. And these are some um, sunflowers. I don't think they're natives, but they had many stems. I grew them from seed and they were really popular with, uh, with the pollinators. Is there one more there, Maria? Oh yeah, this is the um, Culver's root. 
and uh, the bees really worked that until they just sucked everything right out of it. That uh, was really cool. It's a very tall, interesting plant. I, I really like it. It's a beautiful plant in my landscape. Okay, maybe there's another one. There's the Culver's root again, and with a monarch on it. You can see where um, I've got a terraced section here going with all kinds of things uh, growing in there, but the, the Culver's root is just, is just, I don't think that speed well. Um, maybe it is, but I bought it as Culver's root. So from, where did I buy that? I do have, uh, yeah, I do have, I have had Speedwell, and I know that looks like it, but this is a very, very large plant. It's like three feet tall, and those uh, blossoms is, uh, those blossoms are 12 to 16 inches, 20 inches tall, so I think it must be the blue, the blue Culver's root. Of course, because I like blue, I would have picked blue Culver's root. Okay, Maria, is there another one or not? The oh, there's, one. okay, there's my um, bird bath with some rocks in it so that a bee could land on those rocks and kind of tiptoe down and get a drink rather than drown. Um, so, I am really wild about natives. I'm thankful that uh, Maria and Jill and uh, Marsha are working hard for this. And if I have any to share uh, sometime, it'd be fun to be able to get together and share little pieces of uh, little plantlets that I don't need a whole patch of agastache or, or the lavender hyssop. And it's really last year, I did, I just weeded some out. There were so many, I didn't know what to do with them. But this year, if somebody wants some, I'll, I'll save you some. So thank you. Thank you very much for letting me share. Great, thanks, Jackie. Um, this has been really helpful. Yeah, and, and I think it'd be helpful maybe if, if Sue and um, Jill, if you wanted to jump on too. Um, we're, we're on about the hour, so thanks everyone for joining. Um, we can you know, answer a few more questions if there's, um, if people wanna, put them out there. I thought what we might do is just, um, I thought one question that your presentation brought up, um, Jackie, and some people commented on, and I, um, there wasn't an explicit question, but I think one of the ideas that came up um, is this part about um, how, um, let me think about how to explain this. You know, when you move to a place, like you, you know, you moved to your place, you know, not terribly long ago, and you inherit a garden, right? And then you inherit these things that, you know, aren't good. You know, I think everyone probably in the UP has a backyard of periwinkle or vinca or, you know, something that they're not happy with. And so I'm curious if you wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, maybe how have your plant purchases maybe changed, like what you would have bought five years ago versus now, how much, um, native plants are you buying now as a proportion of your plant purchases versus, um, yeah, you know, like how much natives are you buying versus non-natives at this point and how are you managing some of those things you maybe inherited? Okay, I am only buying native plants now. I'm trying to only buy them because they're so important. Um, the things that I inherited, um, I like. They're pretty mostly. The, um, the hill of goldenrod and crown vetch, I wasn't too excited about, and I was going to try, and actually I took about a third of that hill and made that terraced garden in there. But I will be pulling out, um, boy, it's, it's, is it like horsetail fern or something? Um, it's some kind of a fern that is very, oh, it, it's, well, it's, it's, easy it's, like the whole it's easy to pull out, and I think it's horsetail, or it has some long Latin name, but the roots for that are 
really, really long. I'm not going to be able to get rid of it. I just keep pulling it and pulling, trying to manage it, um, trying to take out all, of course, I take out all the knapweed. And actually, besides a nice little um, patio garden that had the lilies and the hollyhocks in it, um, and this rose bush that was crazy taking over everything, I pretty much hacked that up. Um, but th this, this place wasn't very well landscaped, so I brought in stuff from, that I've had for 40 years from other places, how you move things you like. But in the, since uh, I've gotten interested in the pollinators and the native plants, that's really all I'm interested in. They're easier to grow. Uh, I think that somebody, Jean, is saying horsetail rush is, is aggressive. Yeah, I would agree. And I don't think I can get rid of it. Um, but yeah, as far as I'm concerned, all I want are easy plants. I don't want anything I have to baby that, you know, I like things that, that are well adapted and I don't have to uh, do special things with. Mm -hmm. So is that that? Is adequate I hope. Yeah yeah it's, it's nice to hear I think how yeah you make that change and it's not that you have to like plow up your yard and do something you know entirely different I think you know I think and maybe Sue I don't know if you wanted to comment more on this but you know, you know how you said with that that marjoram example is you know trying to if you know you have those non-native species particularly the ones that are aggressive try and contain them in a garden setting or in a container um, that doesn't mean you can't have them, but just like, you know, that, you know, especially where you're working in these more woodland edges or some of these areas where plants are more likely to escape that you can, you know, try and keep well, one, those One thing plants. that I wanted to mention about uh, the common milkweed is that it, uh, it smells wonderful at night. It smells like a tropical flower. So I feel very fortunate that we have a particular place on our hillside right by our deck that we walk. So that our paths are hard packed. Mm -hmm. And the milkweed does try to spread in there, but it's easy to pull out. And we can smell that from where we sit at night. And it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, that's really great. Good. Um, yeah, we haven't had any other questions. I think we can start to tie things up. But I did want to give Sue, you know, you being, you know, the professional botanist and the one who lives in all of this, um, you know, on a, on a regular basis, I wanted to see if you had any other um, points you wanted to make to people after kind of seeing um, Jackie's presentation or some of the other discussion that's been happening within the chat? Um, not really. I mean, I guess just be some of the things that you plant in your yard are that are non-native if they're aggressive and spreading, it, you know, great in your yard, but keep an eye on them because many people live very close to natural areas and if some of those get out, they could really cause a problem. We spent a lot of time on the Ottawa treating honeysuckle that probably originally came from people planting it for landscaping and then spread by birds. Japanese barberries, some of the ones that tolerate shade. Many of your, your garden plants won't move under the forest canopy, they need enough sun. Like spotted knapweed actually isn't a big concern uh, in natural areas because most of the West UP is heavily shaded. Um, but crown vetch is one that does spread pretty strongly. I mean, it's a nice plant for erosion control and it fixes nitrogen, but that's one you, you probably, your neighbors might not want. So I guess if you're going to plant some of those non-native ones, just be sure you're, you're keeping them to your land. <laughs> and the natural land managers will appreciate that. Um, and, I, and I would caution people, I've mentioned prairie nursery, uh, prairie moon, some of those that are coming from um, southern Wisconsin or southwest Minnesota, some of their, their plants are the same native species that we have, but they may not be adapted to our colder winters. And generally, if you can, the closer you can get to your climate, the better. Um, we don't have a lot of sources up here, but the prairie nursery does have a branch over in Duluth that might, their, their stock might be better suited than the stuff coming from Winona, Minnesota, in that area. Great, thank you. All right, everyone, thank you again for coming. It was great to see so many people. Uh, we had fantastic turnout. Um, have a beautiful night. Get outside, enjoy those long days now in warm weather. Um, thank you again from um, all of us at the Keweenaw Land Trust, uh, the Keweenaw Chapter of Wild Ones, 
and um, the Extension Master Gardeners who um, helped to organize this. So we really appreciate you coming. Um, we'll be posting this presentation within a week. Uh, thank you again to our speakers and have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Uh, thanks, Jackie. Thank Welcome. You. Good to see everybody.